Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tudor Price. Uh, I think we're just going to give it a minute or two just to see if there's anyone that's going to be joining us late. It is lunchtime. They might be in the middle of buttering some toast or, uh, or pouring their soup. Uh, we'll just give them a moment or two to get themselves together and then we'll crack on. Okay, I think enough time has elapsed. Hopefully everyone will be refreshed and replenished. So we're going to crack on. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tudor Price. Um, I am the Deputy Chief Exec at the Kent and Victor Chamber of Commerce, but I also run the Kent and Medway Growth Hub, um, which is a helpline service uh, that's being run for businesses at the moment, uh, not just for COVID, but obviously for EU transition. Um, this session is being recorded, uh, so mind your P's and Q's. Um, the the video will be made available to you if you registered through the normal channels uh, and that will contain any links that are referred to throughout the course of uh, this afternoon's Q&A. Um, we are quite small in number, which is great, which means there's an opportunity for you to really get some bespoke advice here. So what I'd like to do is when we get to the Q&A session, I'll actually be inviting you to ask your question verbally. So come and bring yourself off on mute uh, and then uh, ask the question. Now, if you can't remember what question you asked, I have them here in front of me, so don't worry. Um, but I will invite you to, to come forward to see if we can try and uh, get to the bottom and make sure that your question is answered because let's face it, there isn't much time now. So um, we need to sort of try and address these where we can. So um, in the live chat, you will see uh, a number of posts already, uh, which relate to who you're going to hear from and their contact details. And again, there'll be a few links posted into there. But in terms of questions, I will be, again, inviting you to actually ask them in person uh, when we get to that section. But first things first, I'd like to uh, introduce you to your panel um, and they're going to introduce themselves a little bit about who they are, what they do, and then we will crack on with a few presentations. Uh, not too long, uh, because I think we've all had enough uh, chalk and talk over the last few months. Um, and then we'll go straight into Q&A. So uh, first things first, uh, Nathan, can I invite you just to unmute and introduce yourself? Hi Tudor, thank you very much and thank you to everybody for joining us. Uh, my name is Nathan Martin, I'm the Principal Trading Standards Officer for Commercial and Food Services at Kent County Council. Um, I'm one of a member of a small team, um, the Business Advice Services team, um, who are separate from our enforcement arm, whose job is solely to work with businesses to try and help you get compliant, prevent problems before they arise. Um, Question-wise, I'll mainly be answering stuff on food today as that's my area of specialism. Thank you. That's great, Nathan. Thank you very much indeed. Claire, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name's Claire Robinson and I work, I'm a Trading Standards Officer for Kent County Council and I work with Nathan in the Business Advice Services team. So we're hoping we're going to be able to answer some of your questions today. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much indeed. Graham. Thank you, Tudor, and good afternoon, everyone. My name's Graham Card. I'm a an international trade uh, operative. I work uh, with the Kent and Victor Chamber and also the Kent and Medway Growth Hub. In terms of fielding international trade inquiries, uh, I guess mostly based upon a few years these days uh, experience working in that field, um, the way that we look to operate um, with the Chamber and, and the Growth Hub is that if we can't find the answer, then we go about the job in terms of um, investigating what is the answer uh, to your query. So we don't always know all the answers, but we, uh, we leave no stone unturned in, uh, in helping to find the answer. Lovely, Graham, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Wendy. Hello everyone, I'm Wendy May. I'm a Trade and Standards Officer with Kent County Council. I also work in the Business Advice Services team with Claire and Nathan, and I specialize in civil law and product safety. Wendy, thank you very much indeed. And last but by no means least, Richard. Thanks, Judah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Richard Bond. I'm an international trade advisor working for the Department for International Trade. Um, my mandate is basically to support companies as they sell overseas and develop business in markets overseas. And uh, I'll try my best to answer any questions that I can. Richard, thank you very much indeed. That's brilliant. Uh, so as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we had a fantastic panel of experts here. Um, I'm sure they'll cringe when we mention the word expert because it presumes they know everything. And of course, it's a very big subject, which is constantly changing. So it's very hard sometimes to pin things down until we know for certain uh, the outcome of the deal. But that notwithstanding, we will do our best to try and at least give you some reassurance. So presentations first. Nathan, we've got you uh, kicking off. So I'm going to hand over to Nathan, who's going to run you through some information. 
Thank you too, Dad. You just bear with me a moment while I get the prez up. Can you see that, Tuna? Can you see that one, Tuna? Yeah. Uh, we can see yes. it, yes. Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. Okay, bear with me a moment. Just get it running. Okay, here we go. All right, then. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to provide um, a quick update on the trading organic goods because there was a significant change that came out on the 10th of December, literally as we were doing the last Q&A, so it didn't get a chance to make it in on that one. So for organic food and feed to be sold in the EU, it has to have been produced in compliance with EU regulations. But from the 1st of January, organic food and feed produced in the UK has to comply with UK specific regulations rather than EU legislation. However, to minimize the disruption as far as possible, the UK regs are functionally identical to the EU regs. So practically, compliance with the UK regs is equivalent to compliance with the EU regs. Now, there's loads of non-EU countries that produce organic foods to just as high a standard or even a higher standard um, than the EU. Um, the UK is going to be one of them. Um, as such, there are a couple of mechanisms that the EU can use to allow non-EU organic products to be sold in the EU. Uh, firstly, recognising the organic standard of the third country as being equivalent to the EU organic standard. And then second, recognising that the organic control body of a third country um, are capable of certifying that organic food has been manufactured to the EU standard. Now, unfortunately, uh, we've been in limbo since about March 2019, and no decision has been made either way on whether UK standards are going to be equivalent. But on the 10th of December, the EU did recognise UK organic control bodies as being capable of assessing and certifying against the EU standard. Now, the upshot is that UK organic certified food and feed can continue to be exported to the EU until the 31st of December 2021. Now, at this point, they haven't indicated what's going to happen from the 1st of January 2022. But I am optimistic because we've seen this decision and it's reasonable to think that a permanent decision is going to be made over the course of the next year. Now, the new legislation is going to meet some changes, but fortunately, very few. Um, with regards to the composition of the products, um, i.e. what goes in them, uh, and of course how they're produced, that is not going to change at all. But there will be some minor labelling changes. I'm just going to run through them now. And these are in addition to the normal feed information requirements, which are all unchanged. Now, your old control body codes you've been putting on your product need to be replaced. If you're selling goods in England, Scotland and Wales only, you need to mark your products with the new GB control body code as you can see on the slide. Now, each organic control body is also going to have an EU organic control body code, code that includes the word bio rather than org. And if you want to be able to sell your goods, not only in GB, but also in Northern Ireland and the EU, then you need to mark the product with both the GB and the EU organic control body codes. And then lastly, if you're going to sell your goods to a third country, they need to be marked up with the UK organic control body code. Now, organic goods are also going to need a statement of agriculture. Um, so as follows, it's going to be one of either UK agriculture, which you can use if 98% of all the ingredients come from the UK, UK and non-UK agriculture, if it's got a mix of UK and non-UK ingredients, and then finally non-UK agriculture, if 98% of the ingredients are coming from somewhere outside the UK. Now, I know that many businesses are going to have goods that are marked up with the EU organic logo. Um, it's no longer going to be mandatory to use the logo, but you can still use it um, on both goods sold in the UK and goods sold in Northern Ireland and the EU. Now, if you just use the logo in the UK, it doesn't trigger any extra requirements. But if you're going to use it on goods that are being exported to the EU, then you're going to need to include both the UK statement of agriculture and an EU statement of agriculture, which as you can see from the slide, is identical to the UK ones, but you're using EU rather than UK. So none of that is gonna have any effect at all on using UK organic certification body logos, and you can continue to use them without restrictions as before. And then lastly, from 1st of January, all organic goods were, um, that were imported from the EU, 
were going to need a certificate of inspection. Now that requirement has been postponed until the 30th of June, 2021. However, um, they're currently still required from the 1st of July onwards, although we hope of course that that's gonna change. Now, if you do still have to do this, it is unfortunately a paper system. Uh, they are trying to develop a digital system, but it's not there yet. And you obtain the uh, forms directly from your organic control body. Now, guidance is available um, from the gov.uk website under that heading, um, but we'll also provide links to the document itself um, in the description of this video when it goes up. And then lastly, there are my contact details. You'll also find them in the chat. If you do have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Okay. Nathan, thank you very much indeed. That's great. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Some, some, no uh, some, some positive news there in some respects. That's quite good. Hopefully we'll see more of that, and especially the, uh, the pushing back of uh, certificates of inspection until later on in the year. That's going to help a lot, I know. Uh, brilliant. Okay, so we're going to move across to Claire now, who has a, a few uh, slides to share with us as well. Claire, over to you. Hello, thank you, Tudor. Yes, I'm just going to show you some slides. So just bear with me because IT is definitely not my strong point. So. I'm just trying to share the screen. Um, yeah. Can everyone, can you see that? We can indeed, yes. So if you, that's okay, it. And that's there great. you go, that's all up, great stuff. Okay, great, thank you. So I've put together a few slides because just to try and give some a basic overview of the things businesses need to be preparing for. So I thought it might be easier to see it written down as well. So from the 1st of January, the EU transition period will end and the United Kingdom will operate a full external border. This means that controls will be placed on the movement of goods between Great Britain and the EU. So the information is given with the knowledge we have at this time. Some things may change in the coming days and weeks, depending on the negotiations. However, any changes will most likely likely be around tariffs unless there is a complete U-turn, which is very unlikely. <laughs> So from January, we've got full customs declarations in place for exports to the EU. And as has always been the case, the rest of the world. For imports on controlled goods, such as chemicals, alcohol and tobacco, full customs declarations will be necessary from January. For non-controlled standard goods, such as clothing and electrical items, there is an option to defer the customs declarations for up to six months. So this, so customs payments can be made for these types of goods can be conducted away from the border. They are hoping this alleviates some of the pressures at the ports. So from April, there will be controls in place for imports of animals and plants and July, the full customs um, controls will be in place. So this is the staged approach that the government has set out. How effective this will be, we don't know at the moment. So we're just waiting to see. But there are things that you need to do to prepare. So it is advisable to speak to your suppliers and your distribution chain. Are they ready? Do they know what obligations will be? Do they anticipate delays in the supply chain their end? These conversations with your suppliers will be very important. You need to have a GB EORI number as well to move goods to or from the UK. If undertaking any EU customs processes, you or the person dealing with this will need an EU, EU EORI number as well. So I'm just going to skip a slide just because I pulled out what you'll need for your EORI number. So you can you can apply for this online at the transition website um, and you will need your VAT number and date of registration, your national insurance number, your unique taxpayer reference, your SIT code and business start date and your government gateway ID and password. So you will need those items to um, apply for your EORI number. So you'll also need to make customs declarations. Um, this is a very complex process and time consuming. So most businesses use a specialist such as a customs agent to do this. Uh, you need to check if your goods need an import or export license, for example, chemicals, and you can find out at that transition website if you need to get a license. And you will also need to understand your VAT responsibilities and what you may have to pay. This is another complicated area which you may need specialist help with. So it's, it's advisable to take advice on that. Trading standards don't um, do all of these things. I've just listed them all to try and help. So placing goods on the market, when I'm talking about goods, this is non-related non to food products, so not food products. And there are slightly different requirements for that, which Nathan has just been through. So goods placed on the EU in GB markets before the 1st of January can continue to be sold in both areas. Goods placed on the GB market after the 1st of January, you will have a year to make any necessary labelling changes. The UK government is lifting and shifting the legislation. So for the first year at least, there will be a presumption that the goods still comply with the harmonised standards. This gives some lead in time for importers. 
However, there are no leading times for goods being exported to Europe, so all labelling changes and authorised rep requirements must be in place by the 1st of January. As an exporter, you will need to mandate someone based in the EU as the responsible person for your goods, also known as an authorised representative. The AR's name and address and the country of origin must be on your products. The product will need to be labelled in the language where it's going to be sold, and you will need to check that the goods have been registered if this is a requirement. For example, cosmetic products have to be registered onto the notification portal. So you will need to ensure your products comply with the safety and requirements and legislation in both the EU and UK if you are selling to both. So this means, unfortunately, duplication of labelling and authorised representative, representatives. So that's the difficulty with, um, with, with, it, with it being as it is now. So just leading on from the notification portal for cosmetic products, um, this, this SCPN is the English version of the European CPMP portal uh, for cosmetic manufacturers. The much talked about and quite elusive English portal will be available via this link on the 1st of January. So it doesn't give people, although you've got a year to, to upload the details. So, and all cosmetic products placed on the GB market from this date must be registered on this portal. Uh, and so that's the end of the transition that I've got. And I just wanted to chuck a few links on here, which have also gone into the chat, just about the border operating model and some advice where you can get business companion advice there. Um, the border operating model, I would recommend having a look at. It's an in-depth guide of the things that I've just spoken about. So it goes into a lot more detail and will answer a lot of questions if you, if you wanted to have a look at that. That's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Claire, thank you very much indeed. That's very kind. Uh, that's brilliant. And again, just a reminder that um, the video and obviously the slides as part of that will be available to you all post uh, post this session. Right. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to to Graham Card next. Uh, Graham is just going to give us a bit of a verbal update. Um, he's also talking on a particular area that, that is of uh, expertise uh, of, for Richard Bond. So um, we'll be able to sort of get into that in a bit more detail as well. But over to you, Graham. Thank you, Tudor. Um, the, um, the, the reason I'm on the call is um, Trading Standards asked me um, if I could be here in terms of my position as an international trade uh, advisor. Um, one of the key areas, I don't want to, um, I don't want to say that this is the only area that I can look at, uh, but, but one of the key areas that, uh, that I've um, uh, been asked about a number, a real serious number of times over the last little while is uh, that of delivery terms, uh, what are lovingly known as INCO terms. So um, I decided not to put a presentation together because um, there are 11 currently recognised INCO terms and it was a case of where do you draw the line? Which ones do you talk about? Which ones do you leave out? Do you put them all in and then take up the entire hour or how do you do it? So I've decided to just select uh, um, the really seriously appropriate ones and then make reference to the fact that they will always refer to your individual trading circumstances, uh, whether you are selling or whether you are buying. Um, the organizations at each end of the transaction will be, um, uh, will be agreeing on the delivery terms um, uh, between them, and um, that will dictate to what the actual specific INCO terms are. So firstly, just for anyone who doesn't know, INCO terms is an abbreviation. We all love um, uh, to make up words from abbreviations. And in this case, uh, INCO terms is an abbreviation for international commercial terms. And quite simply, the INCO terms determine when delivery takes place uh, when the goods are received by the buyer and they take over um, and that delivery point can be at one end of the scale um, on an X-Works basis so the exporter can sell X-Works and basically what they're saying when they sell X-Works is my loading bay um, is at whatever postcode come and get the goods the goods are ready um, and you know if necessary book yourself in with a time slot into the loading bay. Um, all the way through to the other end of the transaction, where if if the um, if the exporter is actually providing a delivered door service, then they would use the ultimate, if you like, all singing, all dancing delivery term, which is delivered duty paid. Um, there has been um, and still is to to a very great extent a preference 
uh, amongst exporters for X works because they don't have to worry about all the paperwork and a preference amongst importers for delivered duty paid because that means that they can have um, the, the, the goods just turning up um, and um, uh, uh, sorry, I, my, my mind's been taken completely by someone just coming in the door uh, and, and a rainstorm happening over here in Tenterden. Um, let me go back to start to talking about um, uh, delivered duty paid. Um, it is uh, a delivery term which involves um, basically everything being done by the seller uh, and not too much being done by the buyer. Um, in terms of um, uh, things to watch out for, um, if a company is delivering duty paid, uh, that's whether the exporter is sending to Europe duty paid, or whether the uh, supplier overseas in Europe is selling to the UK delivered duty paid, they are um, making themselves responsible for dealing with customs and dealing with VAT. Uh, VAT um, is zero rated for, uh, for exports, um, but that means that if you, if you are the exporter delivering duty paid um, to an overseas destination um, in one of the European 27, then um, the, the uh, local rate of uh, VAT becomes applicable to that delivery. And if you are delivering duty paid, you as the exporter are also in inverted commas, the importer of record. Um, if you choose delivered at place, uh, which is one short of delivered duty paid, if you like, in the league table of, of ECO terms, then you don't have that same responsibility. Um, at the, at the, the beginning end of the scale, the X works that I discussed, um, uh, yes, you avoid all that involvement, but the, perhaps the, the key thing to watch out for is you must obtain proof of export. It's no good saying the goods have been collected and they're on their way to uh, wherever, somewhere abroad, um, without being able to show proof of the fact that they have been exported. And if you can't show proof, then you're liable to uh, a 20% charge um, by uh, the VAT authorities. And um, so that's just a, a, a short run through. I perhaps would add, add that, um, uh, to go back to what I mentioned earlier, there are 11 terms altogether. Um, four of them are specifically for sea freight uh, and um, uh, waterborne transport, the sea, but also barge traffic, that sort of thing. Seven of them are for um, other forms of, uh, of, of transport, um, whether it be air, rail or, um, or road. Um, just to avoid any confusion, sea um, does not include a ferry from Dover to Calais. Uh, a ferry um, is basically regarded as a road delivery. Um, and um, the, the, the INCO terms will be specific to your business. So I'm available on each of the working days between now and the new year, I'm available to take inquiries and, be, and we'll be happy to speak about your specific trading circumstances so that we can we can talk about what is the most appropriate uh, delivery term for your business. Uh, and obviously I'm available um, as a panelist for the, for, for the next 33 minutes. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Um, now, Richard Bond, our International Trade Advisor for the Department of International Trade. Richard, this is an area that you are relatively sort of skilled up on as well. Is there anything you wanted to add to, to sort of Graham's comments? Anything businesses should be particularly sort of trying to sort of get sorted out now? Yes, I mean, I think Graham's covered the basics, which are really important for people to understand. Mm. I mean, INCO terms, as he said, define responsibilities and costs. Um, what I've been stressing to people, uh, my clients over the last few months, is whether you're selling business to business to a distributor, say, in Europe, or a client, a retailer, or whoever, or whether you're selling business B2C to a, to a consumer, you need to be very clear what terms you are going to apply to Europe in 2021. Uh, up to now, people have been sticking goods in a white van uh, with a commercial invoice, possibly with the client's VAT number, off the goods have gone and it's all been lovely. It's been organized without tariffs. Uh, VAT has been you know, something that's been handled across Europe, interest at declarations, it's all been relatively simple. In the future, 
there are whether we have a trade deal or not there are barriers and the processes are going to be more complicated so talk to your client and if you currently deliver to them as graham said you need to be very very specific about whether you are now going to deliver and take responsibility for duty and taxes duties and taxes and become the importer of record in say germany or whether you're going to change the terms to be more specific to say deliver at their warehouse but where they are the importer of record they clear it and they are responsible for any taxes if they come uh, sorry any duties if they come mm. or for vat because actually paying VAT in the European community will require a whole load of extra registrations, potentially appointing fiscal representatives, potentially reporting to the German VAT authorities or whoever. So probably something that most companies want to avoid. And if you're going to be more specific about your delivery terms, to make to change the responsibilities that's the dialogue you need to be having so i can say that most clients of mine who've had who've picked up the phone and had a conversation have been able to achieve dap terms so the client has said yes i'm registered for vat in germany yes i've got a deferment account okay i'm going to have to pay the import charges now which i don't today and in many cases, they've just negotiated perhaps to review the costs in a few months' time and see how perhaps the, 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 the tariff has affected costs and, and maybe they've negotiated a discount or whatever. So B2B, it's been a question of picking up the phone and talking to your customer. B to C, I think you have to, make, if you're selling, say you're fulfilling e-commerce orders, again, I think you have to make a fairly strategic decision. Do I sell um, on delivery DAP terms, let's say through the Royal Mail, through the postal services, in which case the client will get a postcard from the local mail service saying you owe this amount of money, which could be the VAT, any tariffs and a fee for using the deferment system, i.e. Mm. For, for, for credit for those taxes. Um, in which case you may get a very un, unhappy customer if you haven't made it clear on your website that those are your terms, parcel post delivery at place, you will be responsible for the following. Um, if you want to avoid that pain and potentially having unhappy customers, some people have agreed with their courier company to deliver, including all taxes and duties and any charges. And there's no pain for the customer. The customer is more satisfied, but you will have extra costs, which mm -hmm. may eat into your margin. But it's really important to make that decision rather than have potentially a lot of returns, lost VAT, you might get you might get charged for uh, returned goods VAT. Big problems if you don't talk to your customers and make clear what your terms of sale are. So I think on that topic, without getting into the detail, which is individually different for every client, um, having the conversation, please, at an early point. Richard, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for adding those, uh, those little nuggets as well. And um, yeah, e-commerce, of course, very much uh, a popular topic right now. Uh, the growth of e-commerce has been phenomenal. I think there's a report recently which uh, Waitrose highlighted in their report that their on their uh, online now accounts for 70% of their revenue, uh, which is quite a remarkable leap. Obviously, we know why. The question is whether or not that will then stay as a trend because we've obviously learned new skills, which means e-commerce is here to stay and will continue to grow right so thank you very much indeed all we are now into uh, open q a um we have on the call with us one two three four five six seven uh about 10 or so uh, businesses um you should see in the bottom of the uh i think it's the participants panel you should see an option to wave a hand um so if you have questions that you would like to to ask in person then please do just click on that and let me know. Um, 
but I'll, what I'll do, I'll just field a couple of questions first um, from with the, we've submitted early. Um, so I think we'll start with some general ones really around what paperwork is going to be needed at the border. Um, I'm going to come to Wendy for that question. So Wendy, the question here from uh, unknown source is what paperwork is going to be needed at the border? Uh Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, this is uh, possibly one for Graham and Richard too. However, from a trading standards perspective, if you are importing products and they are stopped at the border, um, we would be looking to see for details of the product. For example, what is it? Is it a cosmetic, electrical item, machinery? Um, any safety assessments um, with it, including the name of the assessor, um, information regarding the manufacturing processes, um, a photo of the product and importantly, the label, um, the invoice and packing list so that we can match what's there with what's on the invoice. And also, if it's a cosmetic product, um, what's uh, the number is for the cosmetic product uh, notification portal. So we'd want the CPMP number. When you're importing anything, you would be responsible for understanding the regulations your product is governed by and to have the required documentation available for the products being imported. For example, machinery requires the declaration of conformity to travel with the product, whereas toys don't require that, we would just need to have access to the documentation. So there are differences depending on what products you're importing, um, but these haven't changed as the regulations are currently the same. So it's the same processes at the moment and the same information that was required before. Wow. Okay. Um, that's, thank you very much indeed. There's a, there's a lot of things to take on board there. I'm um, hopefully uh, quite a few will uh, already have this sort of stuff in place. Um, Ginny, I know you're on the call. I can see you. You can't hide. And I know you've also asked the question. So um, Ginny, can I invite you to unmute um, and ask your question if you can remember what it was? Um, yeah, I'll sit up a bit as well now. Um, right. <laughs> yeah, I, do. I have got a few questions because um, my guys in Italy um, have come back to ask me some questions. Which well, I this, is the the this is definitely the place to do it. So go on, ask away as many questions right, as you I'm like and we'll do. There, a grappling to get to terms with it. So um, there's a couple of things. At the moment, I'm aware that on the labels, I will need to put each importer's details on our back of our labels. So we've got three importers in Italy, so I'd have to have different... Um, labels for each importer. Um, the other thing we're looking at now is whether we do um, uh, the FBO, because mm -hmm. um, we have possibly um, something we can do there. One of our shareholders um, has um, a company that he might be able to help us with there. But I don't really know the implications with the FBO. We put their details on the label. Do they then have to would my distributors still sort out their own transport paperwork and everything? How does it work? Okay, great. Right. So I'm going to go to Nathan first, because yeah. I think you, you, you gave a little nod there as if you knew yeah. what uh, Virginia was talking about. And then we'll see if anyone else has anything to add. Well, um, hi, hi, Ginny. Um, the FBO um, is food business operator. Um, so yeah. with, within the UK, you're the food business operator. Um, if you're not yeah. established in the EU, then yeah. the, the importer into the EU becomes the responsible food business yeah. operator. OK, and this is the same situation you, you described at the, at the first part of, of your question. All of those um, people you distribute to, all those businesses sorry, that you distribute to in the EU for that import, for those goods that they're buying, they are the responsible operator. So yeah. it's their details that have to that, that have yeah. to be put on there. Um, what I think you might have been getting at is effectively having um, yeah. another business um, yeah. who is an authorised representative effectively for you within the within the European Union. Yeah, we have um, one of our shareholders has a company in Europe that is registered um, and he imports this yeah. into the UK. So the question he sort of come back with, could we, you know, it's a registered company and everything else out there and it could could we use him or his back as our FBO? Yeah, uh, potentially. Um, DEFRA had given us a little bit of guidance on it uh, because a lot of businesses are trying to either be established themselves or they're using trying to use a separate business that's established mm -hmm. in the EU. If his business is more 
than effectively a registered office address. So if yeah, there is actually a business operating from there. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, potentially he can um, be. There isn't a specific term, an official term for food legislation, but I'm going to call it authorised representative just so that we've got something that we can talk about. Yeah. He can be your authorised representative. You would need a formal relationship with them. So something on paper where he agrees to take responsibility, legal responsibility for all of your goods um, within the EU. He doesn't have to take physical possession of those goods, all right? So they don't have to be shipped to him first. He just has to be willing to take responsibility for those goods that, that go to Europe. So it would need some sort of agreement and he would need to be able uh, to take whatever corrective action um, yeah. is required. So what sort of business does he run at the moment? Is it a food business? Well, that's why I don't know. It was a very random discussion I had. That the question is, I, I can't remember. I don't even know if it's a food business, but it's definitely not alcohol. Okay. So right, would okay. he have to be a food or alcohol? Would he have a license? No. Uh, it wouldn't need um, an alcohol license or anything like that. Yeah. He's, he's, he's not going to need an alcohol license, but he would need to have the knowledge and the capability to take corrective action. So he should have knowledge of food legislation and if the stuff is in Europe and it needs corrective action he should be able to get that done so get that product relabeled or recalled or whatever and from the European community's point of view if something goes wrong and they need to take action against somebody he needs to be willing to have that action taken against him so whether that is serving notices or in an extreme situation prosecution he needs okay. to be aware that that is a, that is a possibility. Yeah. Um, and does the um, on the FBO then so he just takes responsibility but I could still work directly with my distributors in Italy where they arrange the transport we pay them and all that sort of thing would that have to go through this FBO um, with regards to whether they pay the duty and all that sort of thing I can't particularly comment on that just because I don't know Graham uh, and Richard might know. Failing that, I'd recommend that you yeah. contact the HMRC advice line. I was just going to bring Richard in there because he was nodding nodding away at that point. So, Richard, do you want to just pick yeah. up on that point? Hi, Jenny. Um, basically, um, your food business operator, as Nathan clearly said, has the liability and the responsibility for the safety and conformance of your product. So the big issue there is that they agree, as he said, because there is a risk for them. Um, ultimately, you as the manufacturer will be the, it'll all come back to you. But if you have an intermediary, they have to be comfortable with their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. point one to support Nathan. Um, yeah. Point two, you can then sell to clients directly with, so long as they are happy that this guy's name is on the label. I mean, some people are using one distributor as their FBO, and then um, they're worrying that some of their other clients might not want this distributor's name on their, the packs that are in their premises. So, so long as you don't think there's any conflict between your importers and your authorized representative or FBO, um, I think it's, I, my personal feeling is so long as they know what their responsibilities are and can fulfill them and are happy to fulfill them, they don't have to be involved in the importation and their name can be on the label. I don't know if, if Nathan, you, you agree, you agree with that, but I, that's what I've seen other people doing. They're appointing someone as an FBO and then selling directly to clients elsewhere in the EU because actually you only need one FBO. Yeah, I'd agree with what Richard says, um, with the one caveat that it has to be a true FBO because we're yes. seeing a lot of them who aren't. They're just like no virtual service. offices. Yeah, no. yeah. No, um, this company is a bona fide company. Yeah, and I think the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. the other thing it's it's always the case that you know these are these are agreements that are entered into in good faith, but it's not until something goes wrong that you're really tested in terms of hey, the relationship, the trust, but also whether you did your paperwork right in the first place. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah we always always you know, advise caution on that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ginny, um, anything else I, you want to ask? This is the place. Yeah, I've, I've, I've got to ask these questions that my Italian guys, my, mm. my man in Italy, one of them, I've got more than one. Um, 
He wants to know. Well, you've got more, um, more, more than one man in Italy. That sounds very shabby. I have shabby, got a few, and they're all asking me questions. <laughs> okay. Um, he has said for each import, they need to present a health documentation and then have a health clearance. You will have to provide us with the analysis for the batches that we purchase and a copy of the labels that you ship to Italy. So I don't know about this, provide us with analysis of the batches and this health clearance documentation. I don't actually know what he's talking okay. about or what it is. Um, we're not the agency that deals with it, but I tried to look into it as much as I could for you. Um, but for chapter and verse, you're going to have to speak to the Animal and Plant Health Agency and I'll drop their contact details into the chat. What he's referring to um, is uh, health certificates, which only certain products are going to need. Um, so products of animal origin, products that contain products of animal origin, so lasagna, pork pie, meat, etc., that sort of thing, and certain plant products. So some fruit and vegetables, plants for planting, etc., it doesn't look to me like the type of goods that you're sending are going to need an export health certificate. You say you do beer, don't you, uh, Ginny? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, beer. So yeah, yeah. you've got sort of any, any animal parts in there, have you? Intentionally <laughs> or otherwise? Not we knowingly put in there, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but as far as I'm aware, you wouldn't need an export health certificate because of the nature of the goods that you're doing. So it's not everything that needs an export health certificate, it's only certain goods. So products of animal origin and certain restricted plants and etc. So is there, I guess, is there some, you could send me something that I can send to him, to show him that. Yeah, I can, I've, I've pulled off a couple of links which briefly right. explain health certificates. And I've also got the contact detail for the APHA. If you look at there, it should be clear that yeah, your okay. product isn't gonna be, you know, isn't gonna need health certificates. No, I'll do okay. that now. I think just just a Thank word you. of caution here, Ginny, as well. I know from from the chamber's point of view, dealing with certificates of origin for many many years now, uh, quite often you know the, the, these demands are client driven. So the client says, "I'm told I need this. You need to give it to me," um, and it can be tricky because they might be working off information received in in their own sort of native country, whereas That's obviously what I think the, he's getting it from. yeah, yeah. So so you know it it's you be, just be mindful that you can get into a he said, she said scenario sometimes where, so we're like, you know, our, our, our people are telling us this and they say, sometimes, you know, you, you might just need to sort of find, and we, it wouldn't be the first time we've done sort of letters of conformity or letters of, of sort of a reassurance, if you like, in terms of as a chamber of commerce, sometimes that helps get around it. So, so, you know, if you do get stuck into that situation, just give, uh, give Graham a shout and he can sort of pick that up. Okay. Can I, can I Come yeah. back yeah, in. Nathan, please do. Uh, yeah, the one thing that does occur to me is um, if you use isinglass in your product, that might be considered a product of animal origin because it comes from fish. But I think that's tenuous. Uh, if you use isinglass as, as a fining agent. Oh, is that ising? Yeah, we don't have to list that as um, an allergen. No, no, but if you do use it, it could be considered a product of animal origin. I think that's very tentative, though. So I would definitely recommend that you phone the APHA and ask. Yeah, because okay. I don't think yeah. you'll find guidance on that online anyway. No, I probably won't. No. Um, and then the other question he's asked me is about labels. He said they must be in Italian with all the necessary information. I'm presuming that it's like the allergen information. I don't have to translate all the text, you know, like this beer tastes lovely into Italian. No, it's full mandatory um, labelling information. And you see yeah, okay. the, um, I'm going to drop another link in, which, which is I, business I companion guidance. It, it doesn't vary country to country then, EU-wide it's all the same. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. I'm going to drop another link into the chat. It summarises all the mandatory food labelling requirements and those okay. are the ones that will need to be in Italian. Okay. And that's it, even, okay, which I think I've done already, but I think he's panicking over there. Um, with everything, because um, he collects from me FCA, so he arranges the transport and everything. So I guess a lot of his costs are going to go up with this um, Kent permit people are needing and things like that. Well, the Kent, Kent access permit doesn't cost, but the, yeah, it, it's, um, you just oh, got to make free. sure you've got all your paperwork in order. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, you won't be allowed yeah. to go in anywhere near the port. He's on a return run, isn't he? I believe is that right? So he brings stuff over and then he's picking up pallets on the way back. Um, I don't know what he does on the way over, but two of them I've yeah. got, and they um, they they 
turn the lorry over. So I do the customs declaration, and then that moves to the haulage company to sort out the all the other stuff. Yeah. So if he's approaching the port, so if he's outbound and he's approaching the port and comes into Kent, then yeah, I'll need to have a Kent access permit. I believe needs to be in place. But um, we'll talk about that in a bit more. Okay. okay. Uh, just before we, Graham, I'm just going to come back to you in a second. Before we we, we just uh, finish off with Ginny's questions, um, we've obviously got Jamie, Laura, Richard, Rob, Sue, and David on the line as well. Um, I'm going to come to you guys shortly just to see if you have any specific questions you want to ask of our panel here as well. So uh, be prepared. Graham, did you want to add something there? Uh, just a couple of brief comments. Um, uh, the, the, I guess the overall um, observation is, um, without wishing to teach too many people to suck eggs, you know, we're looking at a situation where we're dealing with a market that is, is larger in terms of population um, than the USA. And it's probably, apart from the language issues, it's probably um, best compared with the USA in terms of how companies look at it. And some companies may have a USA distributorship arrangement or sales agency arrangement, but many organizations would have someone in the East Coast, someone in the West Coast, et cetera, and they would break USA down into perhaps manageable regional areas. And I think that's going to be the way to look at Europe um, with the additional um, advantage, as has already been mentioned by one or two people, that because it's 27 countries or one market, once you've organized something specific in one of those countries, it can apply very often to uh, to all of the other countries. The other thing I just wanted to add was uh, FCA was mentioned, which is yeah. on the league table of um, uh, Inco terms is the next one up from X Works. Uh, the difference, the fundamental difference between X Works and FCA, is that under FCA you agree to help out with the export documentation if asked by your customer. Whereas with X Works you don't, uh, and and also just a, a mention of my earlier comment: um, make sure you've got proof of export because you're handing over goods into, in your case, in Tenterden. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Okay, Ginny, have we managed to cover everything off for you? Have you got your your money's worth this, this afternoon? Yeah, that's yeah. There's probably loads. Of, yeah, as as we progress, more questions arise. You know, by tomorrow well, I'll have another load. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The, the, as I say, it's not over till the fat bloke sings, um, uh, and he's not singing just yet. So we'll uh, we'll wait and see what happens. Okay, um, I'm just going to come to some of our other guests here today. So um, uh, Richard, uh, you, you, Richard Burke, that is, um, you're online. Is there anything particular that, that would invite you? You wanted to ask of the panel here today? You need to unmute yourself to have a chat. Hi there, Richard. We can hear you now. Yeah, can you hear now, yeah? Yes. Okay, jolly good. Just something you mentioned just recently, uh, the Kent Passes. We were under the impression that a Kent Pass was required if you're uh, heading for the docks at Dover to go to the continent. Did I understand you there that we also need a Kent Pass if we're importing from the continent into Kent? Uh, someone got got an answer for that, for the Kent Access Permit? KAP. So as far as we're aware, um, and I'm just checking now, there's a guy called Toby Howe. I can give you his contact details in a minute. Toby Howe is the mastermind uh, of the, the KCC traffic plan here in, in Kent. Uh, Toby gave a presentation the other day, which I was at. And in that, it is um, port bound traffic from the UK. So it's outbound. Right. So um, obviously inbound, it would just be the usual customs paperwork and declarations, yeah. making sure that the you know, the, the uh, whoever the haulier is, has sort of got all their paperwork ordered. Once they're across the channel and in the UK, obviously at some point they're going to be return leg. And that return leg is where they're going to need to make sure they've got their Kent access permit sorted out because obviously we don't want people sort of piling up at the port um, on a return journey uh, without you know, joining the back of the queue. coming back empty, there's going to be delivering a container here returning empty, they're still going to need that access. Yeah. yeah, as far as I'm aware, yeah, if they're, if they're port bound, they're going to need to have that um, have that information. Now, um, Nathan's very kindly just posted the uh, uh, the email address for Toby uh, in the live chat, toby.how. Um, yeah, because I think if, if you think about the practicalities, obviously, whether they're empty or loaded, uh, they're, they're all going to want to get through the, the same gates. And uh, this is very much where KCC and the highways are looking to try and manage that flow of traffic. Um, it's possible that there might be uh, some prioritization in that they've got a wonderful thing, what they call um, 
uh, fish and chicks, lovely expression, which essentially fresh fish and, and sort of uh, animals, you know, chickens and stuff like that. They get priority and they get uh, can call in Ebb's fleet. There's a position up there where they stop, get a priority pass, and they can jump the queue. It might be there's something like that in place, but my understanding from what Toby's presentation was is that anyone that's port bound, outbound from the UK, you're going to have to get that Kent access permit. Does that help, Richard? Yeah, very much so. Thank you very much. That's useful. Thanks. Fantastic. Anything else you'd like to ask of the panel here while, while you're on the call? Nope, nope. I've, I've okay. Made, watched, you, you, you've posted uh, the, 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 the names on some doors and I can make further inquiries. So that's been useful. Thank you. That, that's fantastic. No problem at all. I'm glad we've helped. Um, okay, so uh, we've got David and Laura and Rob. Um, if I, any of you guys, or Sue for that matter, uh, anyone want to sort of pop up and just ask any questions that we've got? Ah, Rob, you come online. Rob, how can we help? Yeah, um, just put the video on. Um, certificates of origin for mm. technology products going out, will that be required? Because obviously we deal with uh, outside of Europe, like Saudi Arabia and that. Will, will that come up? I'm presuming it will. Rob, who's your company? Sorry, who do you work for? AAA. AAA. Oh, AAA. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to go to Graham. You, you probably as clued up on uh, certificates of origin as as I am, if not my, probably more so, really. Um, got an answer for that one? Uh, only that until such times we have a trade deal, we, we won't absolutely know what the full answer is regarding certificates of origin because there will be um, one of the reasons for a certificate of origin, as, as the name suggests, is to prove origin so that any preferential trading terms can be uh, exercised in, in terms of those products. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, we're looking at um, a whole new set of documents, basically replacing the typed in words European Community or European Union and being replaced with uh, United Kingdom. Uh, but we are expecting there may be one or two variations from that. There could be a variation for uh, the Irish subject in terms of Northern Ireland, for instance. Because we're now looking at a situation where we have the GB and we have um, Northern Ireland as two entities. I'm sure the politics uh, people wouldn't like me to say this absolutely, um, but you know there are unfortunately some differences now between uh, Great Britain and uh, the United Kingdom in terms of where Northern Ireland sits. But coming mm -hmm. back to the overall market subject sending goods over to Europe. We don't know yet whether we're going to have a preference situation or not. So we don't absolutely know what's going to happen with certificates of origin. And indeed, those other little things which many people use called long-term supplier declarations, we're going to literally find out at the last minute the way I see it at the moment. The other thing to, the other thing to bear in mind, Rob, is um, obviously whilst we're, we're doing these, these super-duper trade deals with other countries, um, you know, that, that I think, what was the one we did most recently? I can't remember, was it not Singapore, was it somewhere? We did, we've just done Kenya and Egypt in the last Egypt, there you go. Days. Yeah. So there, there's quite possibly a requirement for Pacific origin coming into play with those those countries, which may, so some already were in place, but there may be additional ones. So um, again, sort of keep in touch with uh, with the Chamber and we'll sort of make sure we share that information as and when it crops up. Um, okay, is there anything else you wanted to ask at all, Rob? No, that's fine, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. David, you've come online as well. David, good afternoon. Yes. How can um, we help you? Good afternoon. I was just wondering um, if I like to, uh, I'm new to all this uh, customs thing, and if I like to uh, register as an agent, where's the best place to start? Um, if someone is kind enough looking for an apprentice, I'm a professional, but I'm trying to move into new markets now. So now I, mean, I can see the opportunity um presenting itself due to Brexit. So I was wondering, mm. where's the best place to start to sign, sign up to be a customs agent? Well, I, I think probably the first thing to say is, um, I wouldn't say that that ship has sailed, uh, no pun intended, but um, th there has been quite a lot of movement afoot uh, over the last year, two years, as different organizations get into to sort of customs declarations because it was something we used to do 50 years ago and then we stopped and now we've got to start doing it again so there is a resurging industry if you like around that so but it is a big market and therefore there's always room for for, for um, other businesses to come in Graham, I know you've got your hand up, but I think, was it Wendy or Claire? I can't remember you were talking about um, registering as a customs agent. Claire, you've gone off mute. Yeah, so I'm going to come to you first, Claire. Graham, bear with me because obviously Claire's ladies first and all that, you know. 
It was, uh, I did a bit of research on this when the question came in. It's not really a trading standards area, but it is an interesting question and recently has been asked a lot, apparently. So, so much so, in fact, that the BIFA, the British International Freight Association, have produced guidance on how to become a customs agent. So the link to that has been popped in the chat if you wanted to have a look. Um, I would advise to look at this carefully if you're thinking about becoming an agent because you don't need formal training, it says, or qualifications, and you don't need a licence. But it says customs is a very complex process and you have to know the law and your legal obligations so professional tuition is highly recommended excellent now i'm going to come to graham because i think i know what graham's got to share uh, yeah thank you tudor well um uh, it's uh, clear's right um uh having said that um there there is a training uh, arrangement in place for customs agents and if davy would like to have a uh, a chat with me. Um, if, in, in, my email address is already in the chat. If you'd like to um, email me, um, I'm more than happy to set up a, a conversation and have a chat with you about um, how you might get into uh, that area. There, there are um, uh, levels of qualification um, uh, in terms of the educators. I think uh, level three is 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 qualification. Level four, you start looking at certificates and then you go up with diplomas, etc. Uh, in order to have a recognised qualification for getting into customs and working in customs, um, uh, if you can show a level three qualification, uh, you will have, um, uh, you will then have uh, quite a few doors opening. Um, I, Tudor's probably right, the ship has sailed to some extent, but I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's so far off of port that you can't perhaps uh, get in a rowing boat and go and catch it up. Um, there are vacancies um, being shown um, that I see on the internet for, for either people to start during the new year or to start uh, over the next few months if they have got training. So I'd be more than happy to have a chat with you, but also just in terms of one or two things I've picked up um, in, a, in a career that's lasted one or two years in, in trade now. Thank you very much. David, the other thing to bear in mind, I think, depending on how you set yourself up as an agent, um, different uh, brokerages will require access to different ports. You need a license for a port, so there is a, a cost involved. But then Graham's email address is in the chat. Please okay. do uh, have a you know, make contact and uh, and scope out what's involved. But um, obviously, there, as you require, right, there will be a lot of customers declarations required. Okay, um, just keeping it on, on on time. So uh, let me see now. We've got uh, Laura and we've got Sue. Uh, guys, is there anything that you wanted to add or any questions you want to ask here at all? No, okay, that's that's absolutely fine, no problem at all. Um, okay, uh, I think really the, the audience here today obviously are the most important people, so they're the ones that we wanted to ask questions of. I'm just going to make sure for the benefit of the recording, and obviously we'll be circulating this to other people, I'm just going to ask a couple more general questions. So um, there was one here, let me quickly look now, where was it? There we go. Uh, how do I find my HS code? My HS code, who's got the answer to that question there? So uh, Graham, over to you, mate. Uh, you need to um, you need to uh, basically Google it um, is the quick is the is the uh, quick method. Um, you can Google uh, it's either tariff lookup or lookup tariff. That uh, basically takes you straight into the gov.uk uh, site. You then either enter uh, the description of the product um, and it then takes you through to a selection of codes. Or alternatively, what you can do. Um, is enter a code. If you're at all uh, unsure about the code, you can then check whether it's the right code or not. Um, there will normally be uh, eight digits for an export, uh, 10 digits for an import code. Um, it is worth adding to that just one little comment, which is that it is the joint responsibility of the exporter and the importer to ensure that the correct code um, is being used for the product. Uh, it's sometimes called the harmonized code, sometimes called the tariff, a lot of different codes, but that's what we're all talking about when, when we talk about the, the HS code. Okay, that's brilliant. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Richard? Um, can I just add to what Graham said that the mm, HS yes, code is something that even if you sell through e commerce, you will need to know what HS code or customs classification is applicable to your product. 
because it has to go on the invoice, the ex and the export declaration, because it's also the basis on which any duties or tax uh, any duties will be calculated. So it, it has to be something that you know. And um, I think it's a question that a lot of people are asking as well is what tariff, sorry, what will the duties be in the EU? I mean, there is a very useful EU database called Access to Markets. Uh, and you can actually put a description of your goods into that. At the moment it says that the UK, the UK is not on the country of origin because we're in the EU. But as of January 1, you'll be able to look up the uh, code, the describe your product code um, based on the um, logic in the access to market. And it'll give you an idea of what the tariff will be if one is applicable. If we if we trade on WTO rules, as Graham said, if we don't, then you've got certificates of origin and rules of origin to apply. But at the moment, if you want a rough idea, I'm suggesting to people to put the United States into the put as the country of origin, mm. and it and because they're trading under WTO rules. So, for example, cool. cosmetics. Mm. If you put cosmetics in US as the country of origin, the tariff is zero. So that's quite a useful rule of thumb if you want to look uh, look at what tariffs might be. And again, as I said, the knowing your HS code is critical to that process. Fantastic, Richard, thank you very much indeed. Graham, back to you. Yes, it um, occurs to me perhaps I should have added and something Richard said has made me think it's worth adding. Um, if, if in doubt or if you are having difficulty agreeing with um, uh, your customer or your supplier, um, what, it, what is the correct code? Um, uh, because sometimes suppliers want to use a code or customers want to use a code which gets them a lower rate of uh, tariff duty. Um, if there's any doubt whatsoever about what the code should be or if your description doesn't easily fit an existing code, um, and you've exhausted the options of uh, the other options that there are a lot of options listed as other if you've exhausted all of those possibilities there is a, a, a methodology uh, known as um, the customs binding tariff arrangement and basically that what happens there is you you communicate with customs it's done through their south end office uh, usually um, and i can i can offer some help with that if anyone wants me to um, and you literally offer them sample if they need it, perhaps send in a photograph with an email is probably the best way to start the process. They will then, if there is, if there was doubt, they would then come up with a tariff number for you. And that tariff number then becomes binding across international situations. So for instance, if you've got a tariff number uh, that's offered to you by your German supplier and you can't find it in the UK, the German supplier's tariff number, if they've got it agreed with German customs, will be seen to be applicable in the UK and vice versa would be the case. And that applies across most trading companies in the world. Graham, thank you very much indeed. Okay, uh, I think we've got just a one more question I'm gonna put in here. Um, so, uh, do these new trade restrictions apply to exports to the USA? This is a question raised by LMR Gear Tech. Uh, so it might be specific. Um, Claire, I think you had your name against this. I wanna to come to you first, Claire. Yeah, I, there's a short answer to this. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add, but it's no exports to third countries like the USA will remain the same as they are now. And we will be following the same third country rules when exporting to the EU as from the 1st of January. So um, yeah, the, the same. The same will still apply. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, I think, Nathan, is there anything you want to add there at all before we start? I just wanted to come in mm. on what Bernie said about um, dealing with third country rules. What I found is dealing with all the export exports of product of animal origin, etc., to the EU, the guidance that is on the gov.uk website is quite confusing, um, mm. but it's exactly the same rules as when we're trading with a third country. And the guidance they've got up for trading those same products to the third country is actually a lot easier to understand. So if you are looking for that information, just look it up for dealing with the third country because it will be an easier read for you. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to bring things to a close now. Now, just a reminder that uh, all of these uh, links are being put in the chat here and they will be tagged to the video 
that will be made available to you based on the registration details you supplied earlier. Um, there are bound to be more questions. I'm delighted that the, the growth hub is going to be open over, I say delighted, <laughs> not being there myself, but someone will be there to handle all uh, taking inbound queries and calls. Um, there is a phone number in the live chat, but I'll repeat it uh, just in case it's 03333 602300. Uh, the team of advisors are going to be there. Graham has already mentioned that he will also be av available and we have a partnership arrangement with trading standards as well. So any technical questions around labeling or products of animal origin or whatever it might be, um, you can please do get in touch and we will make sure that we get your question answered by one of our panel of experts here today for us. Um, no question is silly at this stage really it's all far far too important so if you're not sure and you think i really don't understand how i do that that's absolutely fine please pick up the phone we are really really keen to make sure that you've got everything you need um, and we have a very compassionate and giving bunch of people here uh, our side of the fence that are very keen to help you um, for now, I think I will just like to thank all of our panelists, to, to Wendy, uh, to Claire, Richard, Graham and Nathan. Thank you all very much indeed for uh, being available to us today. Uh, thank you also to our guests and for the questions, David, Richard, Ginny, um, Rob. Thank you all for your contributions. I do hope we've gone some way to try and uh, put your mind at rest and help you sort of navigate some of this complexity. Um, but for now, I wish you all a very Merry Christmas, uh, a much better New Year than we've had last time. I'm sure it will be better. Things will get better, as uh, Captain Tom says. For now, thank you very much indeed. Have a great afternoon and goodbye.